Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the February 23rd Oklahoma City Planning Commission meeting. If you have pager cell phones or similar devices, we would ask you to turn those off or silence them now, please. If you are not the applicant and you have come to talk to us about a case today, if you would complete a sheet like this, they're available on the table outside the chambers, and we would be happy to hear you when we hear the case. And with that, uh, we are anticipating a bit of a long meeting today, so uh, we would appreciate your cooperation. First order of business is the minutes of the February 9th meeting. Okay, we have a motion, second, cast your votes. Uh, I have not voted, I was not here. Okay, that, those are received, thank you. Next item is uncontested continuances. Okay, there are four requests for uncontested continuances on your agenda, item B18, for case PUD 1628 to defer to March 9th, item B19, for case C-6872, defer to March 9th. Item B-20, for C-6715, to defer to August 24th. And item B-21, for PC-10488, to withdraw completely. And is there anyone here today who came to talk to us about the items just read, 18 through 21? We have a continuous, this is read. Second. We we do have somebody signed up on item 18. C Cecil Freimeyer, item 18. Wrong case? No. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. We have a motion and second to approve the uncontested continuances. Cast your votes. And those are approved. We also have new, one new request for continuance, which is item B3 for case ABC 876 to defer to March 9th. We'll take a motion on that one. Is there anybody on this? No, no one signed up on this one. One. Second. Well, we do have a motion and a second to continue item one. Cast your votes. That's approved. And obviously, we have a request from the public, at least one. Yes, so Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, my name is Eric Rose. I'm an attorney. I represent the uh, Oakdale HOA. And we are protestants in case number 14, PUD 1626. I'm asking for a continuance today. <clears throat> the basis for the continuance is that I've only been on the case for a week. Uh, we want to make a, a helpful presentation to the Commission, uh, including some expert testimony uh, about uh, the proposed project. This would include some environmental information that's pertinent to the issue about the upland forest. <clears throat> We're unable to do that today. Um, under ordinary circumstances, I would say give us two weeks and we'll be ready. That would mean uh, March the 9th, I believe. Um, however, uh, I, I would hope that this case is, is an important case, and it needs to be heard by the entire commission, if at all possible. Uh, so if there were going to be missing commissioners on the 9th, I'd rather it not be heard on that day. I have a conflict on the 23rd. The next available date, I guess, would be April the 13th. It's an important case because it poses a legal issue as to the significance of the comprehensive plan provisions regarding upland forests and the project in question. Uh, and this probably needs to be briefed to you all. Uh, but we also need to put together visual aids and bring in an expert or two to be helpful to you. We can do that if we have time to prepare. Anybody has any questions? I did, by the way, send an email and left a voicemail for Mark Grubbs, the engineer representing the applicant, and informed him that we were going to ask for a continuance. And I got an email back that said they would resist it. So, 
Any questions? Yes, we'll hear from Mr. Grubbs then. We're going to get a brief. Good afternoon, Mark Grubbs, 1819 South Morgan Road. On behalf of the applicant, um, we would respectfully request that this uh, case be heard. Um, it's been continued on multiple times. Um, I'm, I'm sorry that they just retained Mr. Groves a week ago, but it got continued for lack of votes last time, and um, we prefer that it go ahead and be heard today. Thank you, Commissioners. Mr. Cooper? Well, Mr. Chairman, I, I uh, have had the opportunity to meet with both the church as well as the HOA. Uh, on this week um, that I left from that meeting feeling optimistic that some uh, compromise could be uh, they could come to a compromise uh, it seems um, that it would be reasonable to grant a continuance at this point uh, for two weeks allow them to perhaps work through some things um, and then come back um, to us. It would seem that that would be reasonable, Mr. Chairman, as far as... Uh, um, well, I was at the same meeting and I thought maybe we would see some forward movement too. Uh, other commissioners, discussion? Uh, I spoke... Well, I'd like to see it continued. Go ahead, Pat. Can I just say, I finished, I'd like to see it continued. I, given I, one of the concerns that I had and was in the last meeting when we did vote, which was um, that, the, that I raised with Mr. Groves yesterday was kind of the disconnect, it seemed, between some of the messages that the applicant might have been given versus some of the messages that we were hearing uh, at the commission. And so um, I think a, a cogent presentation that might benefit us to have a bit more cohesive message about what the actual asks are. I know Mr. Grubbs has said, well, we did one, we did two, we did. And so I, I, in, in defense of the applicant, I think they've had a hard time exactly understanding what the message from the community uh, has been other than maybe no. Um, so uh, I, I think it might benefit us. I, last time I was all for a vote, I didn't want to However, that was at the end of over an hour devoted to the case. We're a little earlier in the process now. So I, think, I think it would benefit the commission, which that's just my view. I agree with Pat and Pastor. I would just uh, like to note that you do have a um, part of your packet list, all the meetings that that we have had with the H with the Oakdale community, all the requests and the church's responses, um, and you can see, um, I think very clearly, of how much the church has worked with the neighborhood and how many meetings have been had with the neighborhood. Um, it's hard for me to go against the you know majority of the commission on the request for continuance. But you're requesting two weeks, and he's requesting a month and a half. Uh, I think March 9th is, I'll, I, I have no plans to be out of town. I agree with Mike. March 9th is I mean, I don't, I, I, Eric's got, he can do it in that length of time. I have confidence in you, Eric. <laughs> Commissioner, I appreciate your confidence. I'll take that as a compliment. Uh, and yes, we can do it by March 9th, but... This is an important case for the reasons I've mentioned, and there's a rumor going around that a key member of this commission might not be here on the 9th. So I'm a little worried about that. Talking about me. I think the chairman knows about that. <laughs> I really would like the full commission to hear it if we can at all. But I mean, we can I'm have a presentation I'm ready on the 9th. Yeah, well, I'm, but, I'm afraid that uh, three meetings into the future is too big an ask whether I'm here or not. And I think. Two weeks is probably where it ought to settle. Two weeks it is, then. Thank you. And you understand where we are now? Um, 
not a Mark, question of whether you agree, I, just ask you if you understand. <laughs> I, I have a question for Mark. Mark, um, one of the things that um, I guess concerned me is that when you say all of the meetings with the Homeowners Association, it seems that there were several meetings with different partners of the community that it wasn't all of these meetings with the Homeowners Association. It seemed like there were other meetings with other the board. neighborhoods and other things that were not a part of <clears throat> this particular homeowners association with Oakdale Valley. So I think that this continuance will help everybody get streamlined in terms of what are the concerns for uh, the immediate community and kind of begin to work those out. I know there's been, yes, there has been multiple meetings. Um, it started out with the board, um, and then there has also been two meetings with that major a lot of residents were at, and I know that the pastor, I believe you were at one, I believe uh, Chairman Yokel was at one, so at the same one, the last one, which happened between the last continuance and now. And I believe Mr. Groves was at that as well. And he's had plenty of opportunity to review the, the video from the last meeting as well to catch up. So, I, again, I'm not going to go against the majority on the extension of the, of the, uh, the request for continuance for two weeks, um, even though I prefer not to. No, I, I understand. We obviously do have the majority who apparently are going to vote for a continuance. During the two-week period, I would direct you to the master plan and the Upland Forest language and the potential mitigation measures that are provided for in that plan, because obviously the Upland Forest area is a focus, focal point of this discussion, at least at this point. So I'll take a motion. Move for continuance. Second. We have a motion to continuance to continue item 14 to the 9th of March. Cast your votes. And it's continued. Well, no, I think I, I think I emptied the room. <laughs> Folks, as you will clear the chamber, those of you who came for item 14. I don't hear the same thing before. Any other continuous requests from the public today? Same thing we heard before. Hearing none, we'll go to the consent docket. Okay, we have a few items on consent. One was continued. Item number three was continued. Item one is ABC 874. Item two is ABC 875. Item four is CE 951. Item five is C6870. And item six is C6871. And we continued item one. Continued correct? item three. Oh, item yeah. three. Okay. The move we continue item three. We already did. We did that. Okay. I move we the consent docket absent item three. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to move the consent docket absent item three. Cast your votes. And that is done. Under items requiring separate vote, case uh, C6863 is the preliminary plat of Gentry Crossing.
Tim, before you um, start, I want to make some comments. And I, I am sorry that uh, you had to sit through the meeting last time. That was uh, not not by design. It just unfortunately happened out that happened that way. The issue with this case that's on my mind is that uh, we originally heard uh, a request for an amendment to the master plan in September, and we denied it, as we did the zoning request that accompanied it. It went to the city council. They approved the zoning request, which, as I understand it, as a practical matter, becomes a de facto amendment to the plan. And the Planning Commission is the body that adopts the master plan. It's the body that can amend the master plan. And I'm not sure what the implications of this are. It seems to me the integrity of the master plan is very important. And the ability to go around it uh, seems to me inappropriate. And we have before us today a plat application. And we're the body that approves plats. This would be a plat not in conformance with the master plan. So my, con my concern is, is the issue of who who adopts the plan and can amend it, and what happens if something like this occurs? This, if this is a precedent, uh, the master plan can be adopted or amended any time outside of this body. The only piece of that that I would take issue with, and being a lawyer, I just can't help myself. Good. Uh, is it, I, I don't think that the. Um, approval of the zoning creates a de facto amendment to the master plan. What I would say is that the zoning was adopted not in conformance with the master plan. I, I, I would not want to give that action, the approval of the zoning, the authority of even a de facto amendment to the plan. I don't think that's uh, a thing that can be done that way. I agree with the concept that you're that you're putting forth, and I, I think that we need to look very, very carefully, as we always do when we're considering zoning cases, about whether or not they are in compliance with the plan. I think that when council adopted this or approved this zoning without the amendment having been made to the master plan, they adopted that zoning not in conformance with the plan. And I, I think that's something that we cannot be bound by in the sense that just because they did that, we have to uh, operate as though the plan had been amended. At the same time, we don't have to... We don't have to use the plan as an ironclad rule. It's just a suggestion and guidance rule. I, what's, what's, the, what's the purpose in having the master plan if, in fact, anything that is in nonconformance to that master plan is under consideration? What, what is the limit? And once we open up this door, then what becomes the extent to, to which we can hold others to this master plan because obviously people will come in and, and ask for the same considerations once we do this and then we set a precedent that just in my opinion becomes trouble, troubling for uh, what that will look like for us in the future. And I understand it's, um, um, we don't want to be handcuffed but at the same time it is a master plan and we're saying that we've adopted this as a city, and this is the direction that we are moving. But when, when we adopted it at city council level, it was adopted as a guidance document. Not as a, a, a but the city document. council has no legal authority to adopt it. That was uh, just, pardon me? They just receive it. They, they receive it, and they did receive it. They don't actually adopt it. 
And no, by statute, we're the only body who can. Okay, we violate the ordinance all the time. We give exception to the ordinance, I should say. Uh, I fire, think, for instance. I think there, there is, uh, there are times when the very, you know, specific and, and technical application of the plan may not be appropriate, but there, they are extraordinary in some way. I mean, there's some reason why it makes sense in that particular application to do something. And I mean, we have already amended the plan a time or two when there were specific places in which it was not appropriate because of subsequent events or because uh, of error at the time, you know, something was included that maybe shouldn't have been. But I, I don't think that it's, that it's accurate to say that it's just a guideline and we can follow it if we want to and we don't have to if we don't feel like it. We, we do it all the time. I'm not sure I agree with that statement. As, as the number of entries in, in a particular subdivision is controlled by the fire department, is that an ordinance? We're, we're varying subdivision regulations in a situation like that, but we're not varying the plan. And in this case, we actually had an application, heard it, and denied it okay. as being inappropriate and not in conformance with the plan. So this is a different kind of situation in my mind than has occurred up, up to this point in time. And the plan is more than just loose, loose guidance. Uh, by state statute, we're supposed to follow it. We're supposed to adopt uh, applications and approve them when they're in conformance with the plan. That's part of what our, our jo job, our task, what we're assigned to do. Well, John, I've heard you say over and over again that, you, we, that we represent a, a, a recommending body rather than a budget. On zoning, we are. With exception of the plan and plats. Where is, the plat, where is the plat in the ordinances? It's in the state statute, as I understand it. We are the body that approves plats. The city council does not. No, I, we don't. I'm sure. Pardon me? And we, yeah, there's no approval at the city council level. Of plats. Of, of now, plat. you may accept an easement, for example, as it comes to you at the council, because you're the body that has to do that. But the plat itself is approved here. Okay, so what's your point? We shouldn't violate the plat plan in order to conform with the plats? Well, in a case like this where we've already heard, heard the matter, denied the amendment to the plan, and then denied the zoning, it goes to council, they approve it, and they accept it. That these well, no, if it's a, the, the, the PUD that was applied for was a rezoning application. Correct, Tim? And now that the city council said we approve the zoning, no. You said that. I didn't. No comment about the plan, zoning. Now they're back with a plat request. And we're the body that approves plats, preliminary plats and final plats. And I think I have a problem with how this came about and comes back to us, basically telling us that the action we took with respect to a request to amend the plan and then the denial of the zoning since we didn't amend the plan just didn't matter. I think the role, is, I think the role here is more significant than that and more clear. That's my point. But Audrey staff approved this recommendation. If, if we were to consider the plan. I mean, I, I get what, first of all, what does this applicant, how does it uh, violate the plan? Apparently it does. It does. It violates now, the plan because we didn't amend it to allow this type of development <laughs> at this location in the city. And that was the action we took in September. Okay. But the staff, in their recommendation, says we approve it. No. So the planning department section of the staff report 
under the findings says that the plat is not in conformance with the comprehensive plan, but is compliant with PUD 1620, which was approved by City Council. The staff recommendation from the Development Services Department takes into consideration the zoning. It yeah. is compliant with the zoning. She's drawing a distinction between the zoning and the plan amendment to allow the zoning in the first place. And staff recommendation is just that. It's a recommendation. The staff report clearly states that the plat is not in conformance with the comprehensive plan. Mike, you haven't opined yet. And, well, uh, I'm just <laughs> that being it, the amendment to the plan that was proposed was to zone this from AA to RA, right? Yes. That's the one that, that this commission denied. I just wanted to make sure I had the history right. And you're is that is that not right? That's correct. When the commission heard this at the time, the Commission was also considering amending the plan for rural medium and was supportive of a rural medium if the applicant agreed to a minimum size of the lots. It okay. was very close to moving that and accepting that as a comp plan amendment. And at the time, the applicant was not willing to make all of those lots at that minimum lot size and came back with a proposal to modify the lot sizes. So it does not conform to the current land use designation. Okay. Um, but it was, it, I think it was considered by Planning Commission to allow it to go higher density than what it currently is shown as in the plan. Don't know if that matters with this discussion, but that was the history of the, of the previous action. Okay. And so I'm assuming, Tim, that you've not made any changes with respect of what you're bringing to us today to alleviate that concern that Aubrey just flagged well, for us, or uh, mentioned to us, let me put it that way. Thank you. Tim Johnson with Johnson Associates on behalf of the applicant, and really this sounds like it's Mr. Yokel's argument, not really one we're making. Uh, our plat that's before you today has been, was applied for two months ago. And we're just hearing today that there's an issue with regard to the compliance with the plan. The plan's a plan. Uh, it's a plan. The, the, in my opinion, and uh, Mr. Box is behind me and he represented on the zoning case, but when the zoning was approved by the elected officials, it goes, it runs with the land. We're in compliance with the zoning for the land. We don't have to be in compliance with the plan, OKC plan, to get our plan approved. The zoning is the zoning. It's approved. It's there. Our plat's in conformance. With the zoning. Exactly. We don't have to be in conformance with the plan. The city council, the elected officials, deemed the approval of our zoning case to be acceptable, which created the situation that's not in conformance with the plan. Well, I can't buy the last, the last part of that. I, I, I can't buy that, the, that it's not necessary for the plat to be in compliance with the plan, in conformance with the plan. And the fact that they took action that was not in conformance with the plan doesn't alleviate the reality of are, the plan. Are you representing this case? I am as of right now. Um, did you just give you a dollar to retain <laughs> you? Um, David Box, 522 Callport Drive. What was before the commission uh, months ago was the, the comp plan change request. What the plan designates this area right now is called urban reserve. It was our opinion that the city is in no position to be reserving private property through a comprehensive plan. That was the argument that we made here and ultimately at city council. At city council, the PUD was approved. Now, there are state statutes that deal with zoning as it relates to a comprehensive plan. That same language is not found within the platting sec uh, sections in the statutes. Platting is not required to be compliant with a comprehensive plan. Platting is only checked in compliance with the zoning, not a comprehensive plan. 
I mean, if this were to go to district court, the so you make the legal argument that that's the legal argument. That go ahead. particular point, just so I get your understanding, is that the zoning or the plat, right? The plat. What we're here today on. What we're here today on. What I'm now here today on. Yes, you're here today on, as we all are now. Um, does it have to comply with the plan? It simply has to apply, comply with oh. zoning. In. Zoning the statute and provides for that. Yes, if, if, if a plat were to be denied and the district court was reviewing it, they would not review a comprehensive plan, primarily because the, the comprehensive plan under state law is a guide. And what a plat is required to do is to follow the ordinances and the subdivision regulations. So there wouldn't be a discussion at the district court level as to whether or not a plat complied with a comprehensive uh, plan. We might need to look at that because it was my understanding that the state statutes do require plats to be in conformance with the comprehensive plan. So we'd like look, to maybe... I mean, it, it'd be new. I mean, language. if a plat conforms with the city's zoning ordinance, I don't know how you could reach back and have a plan uh, when we're f fully compliant with a very specialized PUD zoning on the site go back to a plan and justify a denial of a plat fully compliant with zoning. I know that there is zoning all over the city that's not in compliance with the comprehensive plan. Sure. It's a non-conforming non right. zoning. Um, that's what this has been deemed as, as a non-conforming zoning. Right. It's at the point in the process when you have to make a decision if something is in conformance with the plan or not. So most zoning that's non-conforming doesn't have to come back for a secondary step in the process, which Planning Commission is bound to review in conformance, like a plat would. They're bound to review zoning in conformance to the plan. I, I'd love to be correct if you have I would statute. just like to go back and look at that language again, because I was at the other and I don't have a statute in front of me, so I can yep. go pull it if you want Thank me you. to, or I can, if you want to wait. I mean, the, if we think about a plan, the plan is a generalized document. There aren't specific regulations within a plan. A plat is looking at, do we meet lot sizes? Do we meet uh, access provisions? The plan is more generalized when it speaks to those, whereas an ordinance and subdivision regulations are very specific. So that's what the plat conforms. If you look at Kelly versus City of Bethany, Ms. Randall, it, it's, it's fairly on point that Plats that conform with zoning and subdivision regulations, some discretion is now gone. Now, it was a different set of circumstances. They're under a different provision. But it stands for the proposition that platting is a function of conforming to zoning and subdivision regulations. Are subdivision regulations and, and uh, ordinances were written to support a plan that's no longer in place? And look at it. We spent five years developing a master plan for the city, which is a guide we are supposed to follow. And because of a lot of reasons, whether it has to do with staffing, budget, timing, the subdivision regulations and ordinances that would be the foundation or support and carry out the, the policies of the plan are going to be years in the making. Well, if so you, do we just sure. wait, go, wait 10 years for the, the benefits of the new plan? No, but if we think about in terms of this, let's just take this piece of property. It was originally zoned AA, and under the comprehensive plan, it was under this urban reserve. Well, if my client decided they wanted to develop it under AA and they wanted to plat it, well, any plat that we came in could not comply with urban reserve. And so what the plan that currently designates this property, there's literally not a single application, whether it be zoning or platting, that could possibly comply with reserve. I don't agree with that. Um, That's what your staff but, told us. Okay. Your applicant had the right to develop the property under their existing zoning. But what if I'm saying is... If they rezone at urban densities, then we would evaluate <laughs> service and the provision of service and lift that urban reserve layer to urbanize the area. That's, that, that is not limiting your applicant to develop the property under their current rights to develop the property. That's not what I was referring to. What I was referring to is developing under AA, but we decided we wanted to plat it. Okay? Well, if that plat under AA were checked against the comprehensive plan, 
The comprehensive plan would say it's under urban reserve. Therefore, a plat of five-acre lots under AA wouldn't meet the comprehensive plan. I'm not talking about what actually happened. I'm talking about a hypothetical in which we decided to develop under our current zoning, but go ahead and plat it. There wouldn't be a plat application that could comply with reserve. We'll talk about it at another time with your hypothetical situation. We should probably talk about what you're here to ask I'll, today. I was just here to offer my insight from the history of the case. I'll let Tim talk about the plot. Well, what do you guys, let's get to, to the rub here. We know where kind of the people are lining up. We're not arguing the points of law. That's not necessarily, I would like to be potentially more informed before I made a decision with respect to this case, Tim. And once again, I hate to put you off, but I have to say that I'm, these are some finer points that I'd like to frankly understand. Not that I disagree with anybody, I'd just like to get a better view. So, I think you got six. Don't know how everybody else is. I mean, unfortunately, that's, I think we got, we, I think I know where Commissioner Yokel's sentiments lie. So, what's your, what's, what, what do you see? Commissioner, I'm not sure I understand what you're asking. I'm, I'm hearing that the chairman is saying that uh, he hasn't said it yet, but I'm hearing that he doesn't think this plaque can be heard today. This is, this is the first case that's brought this set of circumstances to the fore. And as I read, and this application was submitted two months ago. And, and when do you think we see it? I saw it in the ago. staff report before the meeting two weeks ago. Right. Tried to several alert, weeks ago. Tried to alert several uh, commissioners and staff members. But the staff but I, couldn't even tell me that that was your issue. I had no e idea what your issue was. Well, I'm sorry that that didn't happen. So you, we continued this once for two weeks, put the seller on hold. This is a project that the plans have been submitted. It's, they're moving forward. And based on the zoning, zoning that's been approved on the land, uh, I think they have a right to be heard for this plat. We've made every change the staff has asked for. Uh, it's in conformance with the zoning for the land. And it's a preliminary plat. And it's really unfortunate that we find ourselves in this situation. I cannot vote for this today. So I'm going to need the time to go look at this issue and make a decision about it. This is the first time it's come up. And so I think it's. From, from where I'm sitting, it's worth that time. I you want to move it to the heel of the docket, are you saying? No. <laughs> I'm saying I think hmm? I'm going to need a couple of weeks to look at it. We had a couple of weeks. I think the chairman, if he was so strong about this, should have spoke to the staff and asked them to do the research instead of putting us off for two weeks to hear well, something if I new today. Tim, if I hadn't been sick that morning, I'd have done it. And I had fully intended to be here. I'm sorry for your That was two weeks ago. But two weeks ago. Well, that's just the way it is. I, I did what I could. It's your call. This is your show. We're here to present the plat. So it's up before you. Well, Susan Rainbow's going to see if she can find the statute language. If you want, if you want Susan to come back and give us an opinion before the end of the meeting, I'm happy to do that. No. All right. It's my deal. We'll hear this then as, as soon as Susan comes back with her research. That's fine. Put it at the heel. I've got the last item. Do I? Well. I have the last item as well, so I'll be here. Okay. Give her plenty of time. Good. Thank you. He, um, Is that too quickly, Janice? It, for me, yes. My brain doesn't work quite that fast. You know, I'm going to want a chance to think about this and, and think it through and talk it through. So, I would like to see this item continued for two weeks. Well, well Tim, Tim has to agree to Tim's that, too. I'm going to agree to that. So, we'll put it to, as he suggests, we'll put it to the heel and we'll vote. We'll just move, move it along. That's the applicant's request. Okay. On to item eight. Whatever information we have at that time, then, then we'll I think take that's action. the request. Okay. Okay. Item number eight is C sixty-eight fifty-six, the final plat of Brookfield Estates. Good afternoon. I was scheduled to be here on this item, uh, David Box five two two Call Drive. 
here on behalf of the applicant. This is, I believe, the third time the Commission's had the opportunity to hear this item. Um, this is a case in which we zoned it pursuant to a PUD with a design that matched what you see over here labeled as original design. We then had a preliminary plat, again, that matched uh, this design. At the time of the preliminary plat, we had a variance request that was approved on the length of the cul-de-sac. Fast forward to the final plat, an issue arose with side distance. Um, so it was requested, or the, the staff report reflects that variance is needed. So we met with staff, and I think this has been two meetings ago. We met with staff prior to it, and what we were asked to do uh, was to move it uh, as far east as we can. There is no way within this track to comply with the site distance requirement. So we moved it as far east as we could. Uh, at the time, it was our understanding that staff was supportive of that, uh, but it was needing to be continued to perhaps review it again at the staff level, uh, which we complied with. Uh, when we came back last time, which was, I believe, two weeks, no, it was a month ago now, uh, there was a request made to continue it to allow an application to be submitted to reduce the speed along uh, 164th, uh, which we had already done, and over my objection, it was continued. We then went to the Traffic Commission, who denied our speed limit reduction request. Uh, since that time, we have had the opportunity, and I'd like to thank both Debbie Miller and Eric Winger for spending uh, time with us to come up with a solution. So what my client's willing to do is to install one of those flashing yellow signals uh, with a sign that shows an upcoming T intersection um, to, to notify the traveling public to slow down that there's an intersection coming up because of the, the hill. And uh, Mr. Eric Winger is here in attendance today. Um, and I, it's our understanding that he is uh, on board with the solution that we propose. We do need the variance of the site distance, but we can add a TE uh, re requiring us to, to install that flashing yellow uh, static uh, signal that my client has agreed to do. Um, so with that, I would like, if the chairman would, would permit it, Mr. Winger, to, sure. to address the commission. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think that uh, you probably have more history on this case than probably anybody. And I think as we just look to try to hopefully find some resolve and to give you the information that you need to make the final decision, um, Public Works staff has worked extensively to review all the options um, for this particular plat. Um, I think as mentioned, moving the drive to the east um, is going to put it in the best position for your consideration for approval. Um, it increases the maximum availability of the site distance requirement. I think one of the things that is noted, though, is that in no case is it going to be able to meet that. So the variance to the site distance is something that's going to have to be granted. Um, we weren't able to come up with another solution to improve it any further than what's shown on the drawing on screen or what's in your packet today. There were some considerations, though, to the speed limit reduction, which, as noted, was not approved by the Traffic Commission this past Monday. Um, one of the reasons is that on 164th Street, um, they did find that the 85th percentile speed is running right around 49 miles an hour, so reducing the speed at this point would probably have little to no effect. There's also a 10-mile stretch of Northwest 164th from Mustang Road to Pennsylvania that's all currently signed at 45 miles an hour, so it would be a little unique to have just one mile signed for 40 and then to have it go back up to 45 as well. So to address um, the concerns, um, and in our opinion and through the review, um, what is recommended is some type of warning flasher system. Um, the type that was submitted to the Traffic Commission and discussed um, was one that was not received by the developer for improvement. It's actually a, a conflict warning system that uh, only has the lights actuate from sensor, um, so they don't flash full time. They only flash when a vehicle comes up onto a traffic loop and activate them. We don't have one of those currently installed in the city at the moment, but we do have some other locations where we do have intersection warning flashers installed. Um, there's a few locations across the city where those have been installed for, again, warning systems, and that would be a system that we would recommend if the developer um, would be willing to do so. so my suggestion and uh, our request would be is that you consider this, understand that the site distance can't be met. Um, there could potentially be a safety issue, while there's no accident history on this stretch of road, um, but that uh, it be approved with a TE requirement that a flashing warning system be installed, not specific to the conflict warning that was presented to the Traffic Commission, but one that would be a more traditional system that you'd find here in Oklahoma City. 
And Eric, that would be installed at the time the first occupancy permit, or how do you plan to do that, David? We can do it prior to the first CO. Okay. Well, then all we need to do is amend TE6 to include the installation of the flasher? I think we need to vote TE6 separately since it's a variance, since it has to be voted on, um, and okay. then add a, a seven. TE, okay. Just to be sure I understand how this works, would the sign only work in one direction? Is there only a sight distance issue in one direction? Our recommendation would actually be to install it in both directions, even though the sight distance is only failing to the west. But I think as we have an intersection like this, we would, we would ask that signage be installed in both directions, and that would be more traditional with what we've done at the other typical locations. David, I think David's checking on whether they, they want to put in two. I think what he's saying is it's one sign, but if it shows both directions. You need more lead Activate. time, don't you, Eric? On yeah, I mean, you're just going to have to be placed at a distance. It can't be just one sign. You've got to have some lead time coming up to the intersection. It was my understanding that we don't have a side distance issue to the east. Do we? He said that. We don't, so I'm not sure why. I don't know why we could, why my client should have to pay twice the money. Um, if there isn't a side distance issue. I mean, if the, the issue to be resolved is side distance, we'll install the sign. But it seems like we'd be paying several thousand dollars just for the sake of spending several thousand dollars if that safety issue isn't present. Well, I might word that by saying we'd be paying several thousand dollars because the Director of Public Works thinks that this is a good solution to your problem and that's what you ought to do. Well, it... it, it but again, I mean, this was new. This was not something presented until right now is our understanding that it was just one, and it was where the actual conflict existed. Uh, installing a sign when the issue isn't present, I'm not sure to what end that, that well, serves. Well, it's a key intersection either way you approach it, though, right? Right, but the only reason the sign's necessary is because we don't have, we don't meet side distance. Okay, we'll spend the money. <laughs> okay. All right, if there's anything else, any other discussion with item eight, commissioners? Is there anybody who wants to be heard on this matter? Not that I'm aware of. Um, I'm going to move variance CE number six. Is that what I'm doing? Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve the variance to TE six. Cast your votes. And I'm going to move the application with the addition of a TE number six. seven. I, I think I only saw five lights. I'm sorry? I think I only saw five lights, just for the record. I think, we, oh. I think somebody's vote didn't. We need one more. Lee. Lee. Sorry. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you for spotting that. So we move the application with the addition of uh, a seventh TE uh, to require the installation of flashing yellow T intersection signage to sign. East and West. We have a motion and a second to approve item eight, adding TE number seven as Janice read it. Cast your votes. And that's approved. Item nine is case PC 10431 to rezone 9101, Northwest 150th from double A to R1. Good afternoon. David Box, 522 Cockwell Drive. Um, this is an R1 application. Ms. Powers, I believe it was you that mentioned in a previous case, um, certain times in which the, the plan has been amended because an omission or, or an error. Uh, this is one of those times, if you recall, I believe this was the very first amendment to the comp plan. Um, it was when Mr. Gales was on the, the commission still. And up here in the northern uh, half of the section, it was under some sort of uh, reserve. But it was one that during the process, Mr. Gales had pointed out that there is water, there is sewer, and it should have been uh, go ahead. It should have been ULI at the time. Uh, so again, that was the first amendment, I believe. And so what we're here back with today is an R1 application uh, consistent with the plan. And this is a, a plat that you'll see in two weeks. And here, uh, what you'll notice is we have um, one of the, the asks of the plan is to preserve uh, floodplain, common air. We have done that. Um, so what we have is an R1 application that is compliant with the plan. 
Uh, we would ask for your approval. No one has signed up. Second motion. We have a motion and a second to approve item nine, cast your votes, and it's approved. Item number 10 is SPUD 952 to rezone 11818 South Penn from C3 to SPUD 952. Good afternoon again, David Box, 522 for the record. Here on behalf of the applicant, also with me is Ms. Deanne Eaton. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I know that she uh, did sign up to speak. Uh, she is uh, the representative for the applicant, so I would like her to, to speak after me. Um, my client actually owns the property to the east of this um, and has a similar congregate care facility there. What we've done is taken a piece of property that's zoned straight C3 and applied for a SPUD. And if you'll look at page two of your staff report, uh, we include the congregate care housing and convalescent home use, but further defined it specifically to, to what my client does. So uh, we believe, frankly, the city's getting you know, a, a pretty good deal here, getting rid of some straight C3 property for a SPUD that, that uh, is uh, an end user that's already in the area. But I would like Ms. Eaton to, to address the commission so she can explain uh, the line of business that they're in and, and the type of facilities that they run. Please give us your name and address for the record. Yes, Deanne Eaton, 4008 Stephanie Drive Northeast, Albuquerque, New Mexico. Ah, great Th city. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Commission. Ha um, we are the nonprofit faith-based parent company to Somerset. Uh, we were started in Albuquerque by four churches, uh, Episcopalian, Lutheran, Methodist, and Presbyterian. And over the years, we've looked for ways to serve more seniors. Um, a year and a half ago, uh, we acquired the Somerset neighborhood, uh, which is on your screen. Uh, it was built in 1998. It was held by a small family for-profit company. Uh, we acquired it, and since then, we've been able to put in over a half a million dollars in capital improvements. Uh, we've been able to increase staff training and benefits. We've cut staff turnover over by 50 percent. Uh, we provide charity care to residents who qualify, and it's our faith-based mission to serve seniors. Um, we also, just this last Tuesday, Somerset Neighborhood won the category Best Senior Living in the Best of More in South Oklahoma City competitions. So we're looking at ways to expand what we do to provide care for more seniors, and we'd like for your consideration to change the zoning so that we can do so. And um, we're, we, there were a couple of technical recommendations by staff, and we agreed to those changes. And we thank you for your consideration. Thank you. No one has signed up. So we got a motion to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve item 10. Cast your votes. Thank and you. it's approved. Thank you. Item 11 is SPUD. Item 11 is SPUD 957 to rezone 508 Southeast 28th Street from C3 to SPUD 957. Again, David Box, 522 Colcord Drive, here on behalf of the applicant. Uh, this is a scenario in which my client owns uh, the property that we're zoning as well as the property south of this, and it's been operating for quite some time as a vehicle storage yard. Um, unbeknownst to my client, it wasn't zoned I-2 like the balance of his property. Rather, it was zoned C-3. So what we've done is applied for a SPUD to try to remedy this problem. Um, if you are familiar with the area or have driven in the area, there are a host of industrial uses out there. Um, several of the pieces you see on the zoning map as zoned residential are similar to my client, and they're actually being used industrially. Um, it just hasn't come to the attention of a city zoning inspector at this time. Uh, so, we do agree with the TEs, however, what I've handed out and what Ms. Lincoln has uh, deals with the fence. The TE that asks us to remove certain materials, we would ask that we just delete the word steel from TE2. We do want to use a steel fence, and if you look at the picture, what we have now is the chain link fence. Uh, we understand that won't work. We're going to have to, to screen it properly. Uh, but if you continue on, you'll see a steel fence, and that's what's actually east of us. Um, and so what we'd like to do is what you see on the last page, just a, a very nice, clean steel fence that would be in keeping and matching uh, with the, the rest of the area. 
So with that, we would ask for your approval and would be happy to answer any questions. Yeah, no one has signed up. Oh, I have a couple of questions. Yes, sir. Um, uh, David, on the screening, yes. um, there is, what, a church to the north? Yes, sir. And residents, I guess, to uh, the east, is that correct? No, there are, so it's zoned oh, residential west, to, the to the west. To the west, there is. West. So, correct. Okay. And the chain link fence runs um, in front of the church, is that correct? That's correct. So that'll be gone. And so you would do the same kind of steel or aluminum fencing that you currently have around the front? Correct. What this would really do is provide that we have to have site-proof screening um, on the north and west. So anywhere that's not industrial, we'll have to have the site-proof screening. Okay. It'll be an improvement. Do we have a second? Second. Be, second of all. Just ask yes. if this thing. Yes, ma'am. Um, shows C3 on the property that we have here. Yes. Shows a little sliver of R2 right. next to it. Yes. So if you look at the exhibit that's on the screen right now, that R2 piece is actually part of a much larger industrial piece. And how? How that became zoned R2, I, I'm not sure. One gentleman owns, I believe, that whole lot to the east of us. So although it's zoned R2, it, it's okay. certainly industrial. You don't own that? No, correct. Oh, oh, okay. Correct. Can't beat you up about that then. I no. Think. Okay, we have a you motion. Can, but. We have a motion and a second to approve item 11. Cast your votes. Thank you. It's approved. Item 12 is CE 940 to close a drainage easement and street right of way on Northwest 55th Terrence and North Miller Avenue. My name is Steve White, 1724 Northwest 179th Street. <clears throat> this is what basically is an infill site. There was a drainage structure built on the south portion of the site, uh, which is currently zone C. Uh, what I'm requesting is to have a portion of the drainage easement uh, vacated or actually reduced. Um, in, in dealing with staff, we will not be vacating the street, the north-south portion, the oblong square up there will not be none. Just a portion of the uh, easement on the south. Is it accurate to, or do I understand at least that you've agreed uh, to close just the north five feet, to give you an additional five feet on the north side of that easement, is that correct? Uh, no, the easement, it varies <coughs> uh, right now on lot two, which is the west lot, it's it's 10 feet. On lot one, it's, uh, I don't know what it is now, but I've, I've agreed with staff that we'd do 15 on the south, except for the west 58 feet, which would be 12 feet. So is it 20 feet now, and they'll retain a 15-foot easement? Is they'll, that they'll retain 15 feet for the all but the f last 58 feet of lot one, and that'll be 12 feet. And currently, it's 10 feet on lot two, which is that'll, be, that'll, that'll stay the same. Commissioners, this is a, a it's a kind of a unique infill project. The, this uh, application and the one that follows it. Are, um, have been filed in tandem to allow a, a very oddly shaped and strangely placed piece of property to be developed residentially, which is a huge win. Uh, I want to compliment the staff. They have really put their thinking caps on and, and uh, soldiered through this one, trying to figure out a way to make this work. It's a very tight site. Uh, the neighborhood that surrounds it is thrilled to have residential infill here uh, and it'll really provide you know a kind of a residential buffer if that's a thing between the neighborhood and, and Northwest Expressway so this is property that is directly behind what used to be the charcoal oven so um, it's a really tight site with a, a strange layout in terms of the drainage that's there and channelized and very deep and Initially, they were they were a little concerned about it, but they they worked through it, and I I really take my hats off to them. Oh, and the neighborhood, as you say, is very excited about it, and it does give the neighborhood the best possible kind of buffer that they could.
possibly obtain. So, um, is there I anybody really, signed up to be heard? No on one this is matter? signed up. I'm going to move approval of um, item 12. Does everybody know what's getting? Yeah, I say, and that, <laughs> I mean, yeah, the understanding <laughs> is that the, it's the northern portion of the easement that right. is being vacated in Public favor Works of Public Works has agreed to give him five feet. you have feet. A, a rendering of it? That would be great. That would help us. And before, yeah. it, before it goes to council, there'll be a new legal description crafted okay. that will reflect that. I'm not, I don't object. I just want to make sure we all understand, that he under, Mr. White understands and everybody understands exactly what we're vacating. Because I think it's a good answer, let me put it that way. Okay. So the range is 10 to 15 feet as I'm looking at this, depending upon whether it's the Which southeast location, yes. portion or the northwest portion. I have met with staff several times on this, and we've been working very well together. The staff got very creative in trying to figure out how to make this work. Uh, and on every item, we've, we do have an agreement. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve item 12. Cast your votes, and that's approved. Thank you. Item 13 is SPUD 917 to rezone 2701 Northwest Expressway from C3 to SPUD 917. Same project. It's, <coughs> uh, it's to put three homes on that. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, three homes on that site. Uh, I, I have two more of these if somebody else wants to. And you are in agreement with the TEs. I'm sorry, I don't. Easements must be ma retained as provided in the pre previous approval uh, until the water and sanitary sewer remains are abandoned, relocated, etc. So you've seen the TEs, the technical evaluation. Uh, actually, I've, I've not seen that, but uh, so, like I say, staff and I went over everything in detail. Okay. And we, we, I'm actually going to. <clears throat> on the west side, I'm having to move the house south to give the city more room to get into a sewer that's on the north, okay. which I've agreed to. And we okay. Again, no one signed up. Well, I'd like to see a lot more of these, C3 to residential. Um, I'm going to move for approval. We have a motion and a second to approve item 13. Cast your votes. And that's approved. Item 14 was deferred. Item 15 is SPUD 950 to rezone 1132 Northwest 34th from R3 to SPUD 950. Is the applicant here? I'm James Hobie, 3612 Firethorn Drive, James Business Service, representing property owner. Badem Smirnoff and Sylvan Yang. We have presented a plan here to build a fourplex. I uh, believe that we have already submitted that. Uh, we also have a street view photo of there is a, a very dilapidated eyesore uh, single family dwelling that will be removed as a result of this change. So. We think it's very uh, clear that this would be an improvement to the neighborhood. Uh, it abuts two properties to the west, which are both fourplexes, so we feel like it'll it'll reflect uh, the neighborhood well. And it, we did agree to all of the staff recommendations that it be a, a brick structure, and we submitted a site plan as well, which is attached to this. No one signed up, Janice. Um, this is a this is a really beneficial thing, I think. Um, the li uses are limited within the uh, SPD to exactly what they're going to do with the property. We work to figure out the site and the layout and so forth. They've got parking on site. I think um, this is a, a definitely a good treatment for this property, and I'm going to move approval. No, and no one has signed up. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve item 15. Cast your votes. And you're approved. Thank you. Thank you very much. Item 16 is PUD 1631 to rezone 5000 Northeast 23rd Street from R1 I2 PUD 1424, PUD 806, and PUD 
292, so PUD 1631. Good afternoon again. Tim Johnson with Johnson Associates here on behalf of uh, uh, both uh, my client, which is Roger Skeen, who's in the audience here, as well as uh, we have permission to represent the City of Oklahoma City um, Parks Department with regard to the land adjacent to the river, which is the bulk of this tract. Uh, where you see uh, existing PUD 1424 and the R1 surrounding that, that is my client's property, which is basically track three. Um, and the rest, what you see in red on this map, is owned uh, by the city and uh, managed by the Parks Department. Uh, this process has been going on for quite some time. There's been several meetings, including the Parks Department as well as Councilman Pettis, uh, in discussion of first the approval of the lease, which has been approved by and accepted by the City Council, and then the second of the rezoning that would allow the things permitted in the lease to be utilized on the property. Uh, so what we uh, have done is we broke the tracks out into the various tracks that you see in the PUD, uh, primarily to control use and activities. Uh, it was very important to Councilman Pettis that Tract 1 be left uh, in, that, in its natural condition uh, as a buffer, and we agreed to that. However, we included in the PUD because it's in the lease that my client maintains this for the Parks Department. Uh, this was like the wild, wild west out there until these guys got control of the property, were able to gate it off, uh, there was literally people out there shooting targets and so they've done a really good job controlling access to this, cleaning it up. I forget how many truckloads of tires they've hauled off of this site, but they've done a great job cleaning it up. Uh, the lease also includes very strict uh, language with regard to uh, trees and tree removal. Uh, a, a small portion of this site is, is included in the cross timbers. And so that same language has been copied over into this PUD that's before you today. Uh, the uses are, are relatively restrictive. This is the, my client's property, again, track three, is where there currently exists the uh, uh, skiing center. And there's a big slide there, and it's a swimming event center. And so most of the activity on a regular basis will take place in track three. The rest of this land is really set up for events, like a balloon festival, like a concert. The only uh, portable concert venue has to be on the south side of the river and specifically pointing towards Dell City. So I, I should say east. Uh, so uh, that was the way we planned it. We do have some uh, both motocross and uh, off-street uh, bicycling courses that are planned. Parking is planned on track four, uh, and again, this is event parking, not daily parking. The daily activities, again, uh, in the summertime would take place on track three. We do have a RV park that's been of discussion. Uh, we moved it to the east and created a 250-foot uh, buffer to the neighborhood here on the land that we own. You can see this line, this line jogs. Uh, there's a piece here we do not control. Uh, but all the green you see are the treat areas that we intend to retain. The PUD also spe spells out a minimum uh, buffer width on the north edge. I think it's 100 feet minimum, and then it grows as it goes west. We do provide for the ability to have emergency access only from the street coming in from the north, which is Coltrane, and we'll put a, a lock, uh, Knox box locking uh, mechanism there for the, and that's to, uh, allow for the fire department emergency services to take, uh, have more than one access to the site. Um, we've spent some time going over this with the staff and with the, uh, the new presentation of uh, the staff reports, the conditions to achieve conformance. Uh, we have five items. Um, the uh, item number one, as I mentioned, is already in the uh, PUD and it's covered by TE uh, it's covered by one of the TEs.
I'm sorry, I was reading the wrong note. Uh, the, uh, so number one, we agree with, it's required by the Corps of Engineers. Sorry, I was reading my wrong notes. Uh, so we don't, we don't have a choice. Anything we do, we can't get within, uh, we can't do any disturbance within the two-year frequency storm. Right. Uh, item number two is the BMPs. That is also a requirement of Oklahoma City, and that is covered in the TEs. Uh, number three uh, is covered in TE number two, and we agree with that. Uh, number four, clarify the depth of the upland forest buffer. We did uh, clarify that in writing in the PUD. And then locate the RV park in an area to minimize the loss of upland forests. And we did that by moving it east out of the treed areas. But that north uh, west corner of this track three, uh, not all that is upland forest trees. Uh, there's cedars and other trees in there. So again, part of the lease and in this PUD, there are restrictions to any trees that we can remove on the uh, parks department property. It doesn't have that same restriction on the private property, but we have agreed to allow that tree buffer to be there. Uh, and then on to the TEs. Uh, we agree with all four of the TEs that the staff has included. And so uh, we, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. I did get an opportunity to visit with uh, Commissioner Cooper briefly. Uh, as I mentioned, we have had several meetings with uh, the council office and parks department and planning staff. And Tim, I understand that with uh, condition number four, which is the depth of the upland forest buffer, that was agreed to be what, 250 feet? Have I got that right? We've got a buffer of 250 feet from our west side, correct? Okay. On the west, on the west okay. It, west side. And on the, okay. On the north side. We do have that on the north side as well. I believe it's a minimum of 100. There's less trees along the north line. Okay, thank you. No one signed up. Um, I wanted to ask, we do have, um, I guess it's an email of protest concerning the, the separation and the buffers, and it's primarily a question of safety, I guess, with respect to the paintball field. There is no paintball permitted. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, he, he took the paintball out of uh, here. My concern uh, really is uh, in track three and the buffer um, that has been there. And then uh, help me to understand, as currently drawn, the RV parking has been moved. Is that correct? Yeah, as, as currently as shown on our schematic here, this this piece here is 250 feet, and we are east of that 250 foot line. This 250 one. more feet. We're east of the 250 foot buffer. I'm sorry. We're east of our property line by 250 feet to the nearest RV. That's this line right here. Okay. And so on either end of that buffer uh, the, that you're given 250 feet, on either end of that our churches, is that correct? Uh, that is correct. That's a church here, and I believe that's a church right there. And from those churches, your RV pad starts how many feet? Well, on the north church, we're about 200 feet away. On the uh, this one located on our west property line, we are not that far away. Um, I'm, not, I'm not quite understanding if, in fact, the buffer zone is 250 feet. Yeah, but the buffer zone takes this, these two blocks here. I, I got it. From the neighborhood. I got it. Okay. okay. And I'm asking now, how many feet are you from the churches? Uh, we do not have a specified distance in the pod, but I'd be happy to add one. Uh, our goal on this RV park would be to build it similar to uh, Twin Lakes RV Park, which is very popular by the racetrack. Uh, where they retained as many trees as they could. That's their goal here. So you're not going to see a big parking lot. You're going to see RV pads with picnic tables and trees remaining. So if, if there is a concern about the corner of the church's property, we can add a, an additional setback there. I'd be happy to do that. And I, uh, you know, if, if 100 feet you think is good enough, that's, I think we can make that work. That's, you're talking about this corner and their corner. 
Yeah, I'm talking about both. Well, I know that there are two churches. On yeah, this is we're over 200 feet away here. It's just this corner, I think, that would be of concern. Mm -hmm. And I can make we can make can, a, a can minimum. You give, can feet. you give me 100 feet on that without going into the the rest of the upland forests up in? Yes, we can do that. Because you've got walking trails that are designed to go through, which I really, you know, like and appreciate uh, that are just to the uh, north, Correct. I guess, northwest of, of um, the uh, camping area. Is, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. I really like that. But we're going to have to get some additional footage between the church and that RV um, park before I can approve or sure. vote for. We would agree to add a TE that requires show, us to have Show a, me where the stages are around the lake. The current stage is over here on the east side of the uh, main lake. And I think there's a... Roger, I apologize. I don't think I showed on here. Where the, where's the small stage? Yes. Is that the only That's one? That's the only stage. It's okay. close to the island bar. Right. It's so, it, this is the only stage I have. is a small stage on the east side of the island on the... Uh, main lake right here. So there's that only I one stage it, there. I, I, All the other something. stages are over here. Yeah, I know, but it, I thought it said two stages in track three. The, obviously, the large stage is on the other side of the river. Correct. Is there two stages in track three, or uh, just one? There's only one there today. Okay, I don't want another one to be added, so I only want to approve for that one that's existing. Okay, we're good with that. So do you want a, a TE that says the southwest corner of the RV park will be a minimum of 100 feet away from the church to the southwest? Yes. We would agree yes. to that. Yes. Okay. And then you want to limit the uh, performance stage to the one that exists today? Yes. In track three. In track three. Track three. We would agree with that, too. Thank you. Okay. Any other discussion, commissioners? Or can Commissioner Cooper, make a motion. Uh, move uh, for approval of the application with additional TE and the 100 feet um, between the church and the RV pad um, and additional TE uh, for uh, one sound stage in track three. Great. And we're talking about the southwest corner of the RV parking just for clarity. Right. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve item 16 as condition. Cast your votes. Thank and you. that's approved. Item 17 is PUD 1633 to rezone 1300 Northwest 178th Street from R3 to PUD 1633. Mr. Chairman, Council Members, Troy Downing, RBA Architects, 14918 Kurt Square Springs Parkway. Here to represent Mr. Larry Griffin, which is here with us today in the audience, um, would like to answer any questions anybody has on this property. Uh, we've also reviewed the technical evaluations that have been submitted in the report. The only thing we'd respectfully like to discuss is item number three. We do not own or control the property to the east of this property where they're asking for is a stub street um, to be added um, to the adjacent property. We'd ask that this requirement not be made a part of this, but if possible. And I'm here to answer any questions. No one signed up, commissioners. It, I think the idea of the stub was just to maybe encourage some ability to have traffic flow between the areas if the latter place to the east is developed. but. Lee, no one signed up on this. Move for adoption. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve item 17 as presented. Cast your votes. And you're approved. Thank you. Thanks. Coming back to item 7, I believe. Drum roll. 
believe Ms. Randall wants some time. We, we did uh, look, and under Title 11, Section 41, which is the statute dealing with platting, there is absolutely no reference to the comprehensive plan uh, that says platting must be done in conformance. In fact, if you look at your own subdivision regulations, uh, what you'll find is it says every plat shall conform to existing zoning and subdivision regulations applicable at the time of preliminary plat approval. No reference whatsoever to a comprehensive plan. Susan? Um, I didn't find anything as, other than, you know, in the platting statutes it talks about that every plat approved by the commission by virtue of the approval shall be deemed to be an amendment or an addition to the plan thereof. It doesn't say that prior to that time it has to be in conformance, but I would like time to look at it because I don't know if there's some other area that I can look at or if there's cases. Um, I'm not ready at this time to just make that from the horseshoe. Oh, yeah, there, I, I mean, there's another section that talks about municipal regulations as to building structures and land shall be made in accordance with a comprehensive plan and be designed to accomplish these objectives. I don't know that a platting is regulations. Thank you. <laughs> but, you know, I, that's why I would like to have a little bit more time to look at that thing, um, that issue. Um, this is the first time that it's been addressed to me. So I don't feel comfortable giving an opinion. Um, that seems reasonable to me. I would like that time as well to be able to look at it. Well, it seems like our option is two weeks is a little quicker than uh, marching across the street, so we'll take our two weeks. Okay. So I'll move to continue item number seven for two weeks. We have a motion and a second to continue item seven for two weeks to the 9th of March. Cast your votes, and that's approved. Thank you. And that, con that concludes the items for individual consideration. Planning Commission members, discussion? Discussion, commissioners? Okay. Planning, I'm sorry. Lead, Jeff. Okay. Planning department? Just wanted to uh, say with all the commission here that we were hoping to hold an urban development committee meeting today. We weren't able to get quorum for that to discuss the proposed ABC ordinance change. You've heard it before, but it's come back with some modifications. We're hoping to reschedule that UDC meeting for March 9th. We'll be following up with you on a proposed time to see if we can get a quorum for that. Um, also wanted you to mark your calendars for March 23rd for a study session. We're hoping to review the proposed geo bond process and potential projects with you. So if you could mark your dates on your calendars for that, we'll be in contact about scheduling it. And we do have our last geo bond public workshop next Tuesday. Um, this will be at Spring Lake Metro Tech Campus. Uh, I believe it's from 5 to 8 p.m. I think it's in the evening that day. Um, we have held seven different meetings. This will be the eighth uh, workshop around the city for the public to come wherever they find it convenient. And we've had several council members request separate town hall meetings with um, a, a good turnout from different people in those wards. So please help us encourage attendance at that last workshop if you know anybody who didn't get a chance to go yet that would like to go. Development services. Municipal Councilor, you have something to do in the next two weeks? Nothing further today. <laughs> okay. Citizens to be heard. Any other business commissioners? If not, we're adjourned at 3 p.m.